Hello and welcome to another video which will get you top grades. You're probably wondering what is it I need to know about the structure of a Christmas carol and once I know that how would I apply that in exam questions. So these are the two things you're going to find out today. Firstly we want to know that Dickens has deliberately chosen a five act structure for his novel. This is actually typical of a Shakespearean tragedy, a play. He makes his narrator refer to the ghost of Shakespeare's most famous tragedy, Hamlet, right at the start of this novel, just to make sure that we know what he is up to. He's playing with the idea of tragedy. However, because this is an inspirational story for Christmas, Dickens has the wonderful idea to call these acts, these chapters, staves. Now these are the five parts of a Christmas carol that you might sing at church, just as his audience would. The intention, of course, is to be uplifting. He hints that, although Scrooge's story could have been a Shakespearean tragedy, Scrooge's transformation is an uplifting celebration of Christmas, celebrating the power of humanity and family and redemption and rebirth. Dickens is also playful in the way that he begins with a ghost story, not what we would expect of a Christmas story. The famous first line is, Marley was dead to begin with. And this lets us know we're in the supernatural genre. If I ask you to number how many ghosts appear in the story, you might guess three. The ghosts of Christmas past, present and future, those spirits of Christmas. And you might add Jacob Marley. However, you'd still be far short of the true total. This book is steeped in ghosts. We've got Hamlet's father. We also have the narrator and also the dozens of businessmen who appear as ghosts shown to Scrooge by Marley in Stave 1. The narrator also calls Scrooge and Marley two kindred spirits, a brilliant pun on the idea that they are both ghosts, not just Marley. Obviously, with Scrooge, he's suggesting this metaphorically, that Scrooge is so spiritually dead that he might already be a corpse. It's also worth remembering how the book would have been read in Dickens' time. It would have been performed perhaps by the father or the mother or a highly literate child to the rest of the family during the long winter evenings. Families then were trapped indoors without electricity, radio, phones, internet and Wi-Fi, television. You get the idea. In Dickens' time, you made your own entertainment and you learned to be pretty good at it. This novella was written for performance. Dickens himself adapted and performed it dozens of times to huge audiences of thousands who were amazed at his ability to take on the different personalities of his characters. The book is therefore structured to provide horror and dread, melodrama, but in an entertaining fashion. Dickens wanted to deliver a chill in common with the winter rather than the gory shock fest we might be used to in the modern cinema. Now, just as a five-act tragedy is propelled by an inevitable fate of the hero, so the five-stave structure of a carol that we sing demands to be completed. No one stops singing a carol a couple of verses in. Dickens' structure echoes this idea of inevitability. When Marley tells Scrooge, you will be haunted by three spirits. Scrooge doesn't have any choice in what will happen to him, but he does have a choice in how he reacts to them. That is the moral of the story. 
The inevitability of the happy ending demanded by this structure has upset many critics. It's become fashionable to argue that Scrooge's conversion isn't really psychologically convincing. Obviously, because this is a Mr. Sally's Top Grades Made Easy video, I'm going to be arguing the opposite to the conventional view. One of the most famous critics was Edmund Wilson, and he said this. Shall we ask what Scrooge would actually be like if we were to follow him beyond the frame of the story? Unquestionably, he would relapse when the merriment was over, if not while it was still going on, into moroseness, vindictiveness, suspicion. He would, that is to say, reveal himself as the victim of a manic depressive cycle and a very uncomfortable person. To which I say, humbug! This type of objection to Scrooge's transformation was anticipated by Dickens, and it's why he introduced a ghostly narrator. So we're sort of forced to believe in the ending. Although the narrator helps establish the novel as a proper ghost story, and he helps set a humorous tone, because he is a very funny ghost, the ghost also has supernatural insight into the future. And consequently, at the end of Stay 5, it's not just Scrooge telling us that he's a changed man, or even Dickens himself. Instead, we're invited to believe it is an omniscient spirit who, as we've seen in the novel, lives outside of time and is therefore able to see the character's fates. This invites us to believe that Scrooge's conversion is real. It isn't just a sentimental ending to please his sentimental readers at the most sentimental time of the year. Dickens also plays with the idea of resurrection and rebirth because this is partly a Christian allegory. As you'll see in later videos, the Christian element of the story is downplayed. Dickens is much more interested in what we can do for our fellow man now, rather than waiting for salvation in heaven later. However, he needs to tap into his reader's Christian faith, and consequently Scrooge is introduced to us through descriptions that suggest he is already frozen emotionally. He appears little different from a corpse. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. Now the purpose of this description isn't just to reveal his complete lack of feeling for his fellow man, it's mainly to suggest that he's like a corpse with no interest in heat or cold. This allows Dickens to prepare for the transformation of rebirth that will happen in the final stave. In stave five, the language changes. He repeatedly compares Scrooge to a baby. I'm quite a baby. Never mind. I don't care. I'd rather be a baby, says Scrooge. All Christian readers would recognise the deliberate parallel with the baby Jesus, whose birth they're celebrating on Christmas Day. The rebirth in the final stave is also the story of Tiny Tim, who's almost literally brought back from the dead, a death that could only be prevented by Scrooge's own transformation and rebirth. The narrator tells us, and to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. Now we can see that Tiny Tim is the fulcrum around whom the whole story pivots. This is why Dickens gives him the final words of the novel. God bless us, everyone. This reminds all readers that the transformation is not just a feel-good Christmas tale, but a campaign by Dickens for social justice. Dickens demands that we make the lives of the poor, and poor children in particular, the centre of our thoughts. These wealthy readers can transform the lives of so many poor Victorians suffering under the unfair poor laws and the indifference of the middle classes. 
Now, it's worth noting that the video so far is actually as good as an essay. That's a grade 9 essay you've had right there, should you ever get a question on the structure of a novel. OK, I can only really think of nine possible varieties of question that you'll get on this text, and let's see how we would apply what you've learnt about structure to each one. Well, if you're writing about Bob Cratchit as a sympathetic character, the structural elements will be the change from stave one to stave five. Obviously, what we've got about Tiny Tim will fit in there. But you want to link to the author's purpose in showing this change. I've shown you that it's not just about entertainment. It is a political and social statement where Dickens wants to get his readers to behave differently and to believe in the change that Scrooge undergoes so that they can mirror it in their own behaviour. Next, we might look at a frightening atmosphere, and here you will consider why he has so many ghosts in the novel and the importance of the supernatural. This ability to see into the future is crucial to the structure of the novel because it is a future that's going to happen to all the poor people in London or in England, unless the readers learn the same moral lessons as Scrooge. And you can also talk about why Dickens doesn't want just a frightening atmosphere, but he also wants humour, melodrama, and this kind of cathartic release at the end. Well, if you get a question on the ghosts or the supernatural, we've already covered that when we looked at the frightening aspect. If we want to talk about Scrooge as a convincing character, then we have to look at this transformation built into the structure, and you can now do that. Is he believable? Well, that's the same as being convincing. And how is he an outsider? Again, you're going to look at that contrast between stave one and stave five. Now, what's the point of portraying Scrooge as an outsider? Well, it's to show that the reader who doesn't behave as Scrooge does at the end is also themselves an outsider to society. In other words, they're ignoring the majority of society who are not as well off as they are. Number five, the idea of redemption, responsibility and compassion. Well, that's easy to show in, again, that stave five structure, the emphasis on Tiny Tim, all the clues I gave you about the Christian idea of rebirth, which is mirrored not just in the language of Scrooge like a baby, but also the language of Scrooge being spiritually dead at the beginning, and obviously the transformation in the fortunes of Tiny Tim, almost literally brought back from the dead. Now, when we talk about wealth and poverty, we're also going to refer to that structure and, if you like, the fate of Tiny Tim. So the role of wealth becomes to alleviate the pains of poverty. We might say that the ghosts themselves are deliberately not made to feel real because this isn't a real story of punishments that you will receive on Earth. It might also be that Dickens is suggesting you're not going to receive these punishments in hell either. Marley's version of hell doesn't seem too plausible. And perhaps in that way, Dickens is suggesting that the whole idea that we're going to be saved and lead a better life in heaven is also a fiction. We can't afford to allow people to suffer in the present because we know that their souls will go to heaven in the future. No, Dickens is arguing that we need to look after people here and now while they're alive. That, he suggests, is our Christian duty and our moral duty. How does the structure help us look at the idea of family and Christmas? Well, we covered a lot with Stave 5 that looks at the role of Tiny Tim, to whom Scrooge becomes a second father. And obviously, when we're talking about Christmas, we're talking about this idea of rebirth and redemption in Stave 5. How does Dickens make the sense of place important? This is a brilliant question because it really stumped me. I haven't concentrated on the sense of place in my structure. However, if we go back to it, we can see that it's centred in the fog and ice at the beginning. But at the end, we have this idea of warmth, 
So we have a transformation, a metaphorical transformation, of course, because it's still cold and snowy outside. And we can also see the place of the setting itself as also metaphorical. Just as the ghosts aren't real, the setting isn't rooted in a particular place, because Dickens wants his readers to see that place as eternal. It's always the kind of Christmas that is apparent in A Christmas Carol. Full of snow, full of families getting together and enjoying each other's company. So we would argue then that the most important place in the novel is the transformation at the end of Stay 5. It is the emotional place, this new world, that Scrooge has woken up to at the end. Now, obviously, you'd still write about all the physical places in the rest of your essay, but what I'm telling you is how you would bring in that change of structure in Stay 5 and to make your structural point link to the idea of place. And then finally, what's the role of Tiny Tim? Well, as you've seen, he is the fulcrum around which the whole story pivots. If we took Tiny Tim out of the story, would Scrooge actually change? I think we can argue quite strongly through Scrooge's questions about has Tiny Tim survived in Stave 5, that it's his relationship with Tiny Tim that triggers his transformation. So all these journeys into the past where he saw his own childhood, where he saw Belle, who he used to love, where he saw what a great time he used to have with Fezziwig, his first employer. None of those things alone are enough to transform him, nor is it enough when he finds out that he dies unmourned. In fact, people seem grateful for his death. No, the key thing is that Tiny Tim dies unless Scrooge changes. And of course, that links to the campaigning purpose of the novel. We too, implies Dickens, can save lives if we'll do a little bit of a change, a little fraction of Scrooge's magnificent donations to charity. So you've followed a grade 9 essay about the structure, and now you've seen how you could apply the structure to all nine possible questions that you'll get in the exam, you should really start clicking on a video appearing here to get more top grades made easy with Mr. Sallis. See you soon on my channel.